Bobby. Hi, my name is Leandro. I've been a, a developer, an engineer, a product person for quite some time. I've worked a lot with startups over the years. Uh, I know that some of you can't see here on the bottom. Uh, I usually have these slides like a third up, so it's like visible all the way back. Uh, but this is a little bit of uh, my career professionally, what I've been doing, and how I've moved <laughs> from different languages. So you can see I've gone through a lot of tech stacks. Uh, I've even done and shipped some Excel applications, believe it or not. It's a very nice functional program language if you get used to cells. And um, most recently, I've been streaming a lot of OCaml content. And it's been a lot of fun. Wait, that should be playing. Why doesn't it play? OK, well, we tried. <laughs> it should be pretty un animated. And uh, in that stream, we've been building all of the things that I'm going to share with you today. So all the stuff that's, uh, that's going to be on screen is something that we built in the last five months or so live. So there's like proof that has been written from scratch, right? So if you want to go there and see me just be a fool on screen, you can do it <coughs> completely fine. Some interesting things have been happening in this space. We started to get tons of people watching people ride off camel. And sometimes the number of viewers have been insane. Can you imagine that? Coding with like 2,000 people just looking at you, mistyped things? <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, right? Yeah. Anyways, it's been a lot of fun. Twitch TV, Leo Sarah, that's my handle. You can find me on social media everywhere with the same thing. Today, I want to talk about programs that run forever, programs that never fail, programs that bring you joy, and how maybe we riot, we can get all of those together. And they're a little superlative, right? Obviously, no program will run forever. At least, nobody will be around to verify that, right? And programs do fail all the time but we go lengths to make sure they don't, right? And most programs actually make you very angry. If you were here two talks ago, <laughs> Sabine was actually pretty angry at some of the things that you know, OpenAPI did. <laughs> and uh, we'll talk a little bit about Riot, into the design system, the design decisions made into that system, right? And we'll talk a little bit about the ecosystem and the community. Can you hear me well? Yes. yes. Okay, I'll just get some water because I have to like pump the volume a little bit. And it'll be nice to... Yes, oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and then we'll get started. <laughs> Suspense. <laughs> so, programs that run forever, Erlang. Erlang, uh, how many of you know of Erlang? Okay, most of you, how many of you have written Erlang? Okay, maybe like a third, in kind of a lambda shape, I like that. <laughs> So Erlang is a language that comes straight out of industry, right? It was built directly to solve a business problem, right? We have the switches, we need to be able to program them. They get rather large in terms of resources, programmers and C code that need to be written and to configure them. They will run for maybe 30 years, right, uh, give or take, out there in the field. And we need to be able to reprogram them in a full tolerant way. So that if something goes wrong and we need to go there and fix them, right, we can do that without 911 calls feelings, right? Um, just very, very, you know, bad if that happens. So how do we do that? And a team of people there uh, decided that the clarity part of the programming was going to be the right way of solving that problem, right? So around that time, 1986, there was nothing that did that. You can maybe play around with Prolog, which is what they did, right? But it didn't actually have the kind of performance you would need to actually build systems like that. So they ended up building Erlang. And they... <laughs> Uh, advertise it as a practical functional programming language for a parallel world. Uh, Joe, Mike, and Robert, great people, great language designers, they made very interesting decisions with the language, and we'll look a little bit into that. So I want to give you a rough idea of what is it like to build systems in a, in a language that is designed so you can run programs forever. Primarily, you have functional programming that's effectual, so there's no track side effects anywhere you can just print stuff. Some people call that impure. I don't like that word. I think it's practical. <laughs> Concurrency is the way to go. We are going to have a lot of tiny processes that are isolated from each other and communicate to solve problems. So as Joe put it in, in his books, right? people in the real world, we don't share memories by accessing each other's brains somehow. We should share messages. And this what's happening right here is literally that. I am sending messages, broadcasting to all of you. right? And then your internal state machine sort of processes that and go like, oh yeah, this guy. He's, he knows his stuff, right? <laughs> or not, depending where you're coming from. And we're going to build fault tolerance by using these things. <clears throat> Process isolation, right? Building hierarchies of supervision where one person checks on the other. 
also happening right here. We go, Marco, right? He's checking on me, checking that I'm not failing and give the presentation, right? And some of the people are checking on you, so behave. <laughs> and finally, we're going to use the let it crash philosophy, which is a very strange philosophy in most programming languages, right, to try to use. Uh, all of those things will give us multicore for free. We might not actually get to talk much about that, but yeah. So just to give you a primer on Erlang, this is a piece of Erlang code. You have file, it's a module definition, right? There's some exports there that need to be made explicit, right? There's no module level values, only functions. So really a module is like a collection of functions that you are able to sort of call at some point, right? And then you define functions with control flow that uses pattern matching on the inputs. So this is the function when you pass a value and we say this is defined for this input, right? And if you give me exactly that input, then you get that output. Done, right? Uh, also, there is no loop controls. There's no uh, loop constructs in the language, so we use recursion. And uh, I realize now it's not very clear, but I tried to sort of reinforce that idea by showing the talk within the talk. But you know, recursion is not as obvious sometimes. How does that work? A process, right, runs some code and sends messages to another process. This is a, the basic primitive that we have in our language. Looking a little more in depth, you see that a process actually has some code, a module, right, that is calling a function with some state, and then it has a mailbox. And a process is like a piece of data that lives within the, the virtual machine. And when you send a message from one process to the other, you're putting that message in a mailbox, right? That's kind of it. This is how message passing works in Erlang. Very, very high level overview. I'm not trying to teach you Erlang, I'm just trying to show you some of the primitives it uses, right? How do we make programs that run forever with Erlang? We do that by building fault tolerance through this thing. And I took this nice image from adoptingerlang.com. If you're interested in adopting Erlang, that's the website to go to. Fred Hebert and other people there that have written a lot of docs in the ecosystem have done some of this work. Usually you build these hierarchies where you have a root process that is monitoring some supervised process that is monitoring all the processes that are monitoring more processes, right? So in some way, we build the system by saying these are going to be all of the moving parts that are completely isolated from each other, right? Then message each other to get work done. Just in the same way that the people at the conference have coordinated work, right? And Marco is just one of the people in the whole conference hypervision tree, supervision tree, right? And eventually he gets a message saying like, okay, get the mic set up for the next guy. Like, he sends a message to me, here's the microphone, right? And the photographer as well. All right, so this is a little bit of how Erlang works, right? How do we get multicore for free? This is the basic, very, very basic architecture of the Erlang VM. You have schedulers. Each one of those is mapped directly to a thread. Each one of those has a process queue. Mass processes get scheduled on those queues, right? And eventually they will execute. There's a virtual machine internally. I'm not going to get into that. But between process queues, there is not so much of an amicable relationship. They still work from each other. So as soon as a, work, uh, um, a scheduler is out of work, you will be able to say, hey, you have something to do, I'll just grab that from you and do it for you instead. So in that sense, if you have a thousand processes, right, then they'll get distributed across all the schedulers for free automatically. This is what we mean multi-core for free on Earth. Key takeaways, code is sequential by default. We design systems with isolated processes, right? We build reliability through this isolation and supervision hierarchies, and we get free multicore. Sounds good? Yeah, awesome. Let's talk about programs that never fail. Again, hyperbolic here. Ocaml. Ocaml programs do fail. So do Haskell programs and many other programs in other languages that claim that they never fail. But they try really hard, and they give us some really interesting tools right, to approach reliability from a different angle, right? Instead of saying programs will fail, we'll embrace them with supervision trees, they say we'll make sure that programs cannot do things they're not designed to do, so they won't fail that way. We get type systems like OCaml. OCaml comes from academic research primarily, right? And is following a big line of research, right, that comes even back from the 70s, but in its current shape, it comes from INRIA, a French university. And we got here uh, Professor Xavier, Xavier Leroy, which I couldn't get a nice caricature from, 
but I'll try to for the next one. Next time I'll give this talk. And this language is a, an ML language, which you probably are know since you're at this conference and there's a lot of type talk here. And it has a very sound and small and expressive type systems, right? It has just a few things that if you learn them, you'll be super productive. In comparison to, for example, the Swift type system that we just saw was pretty big, especially the whole protocol part. Um, it is rather pragmatic, right? So it's immutable by default, but we can be immutable if we need to. It is not free to be immutable, right? There's a cost to that, the right barrier, we call it, right? But sometimes it's actually much, much faster to be immutable than to be immutable. So we do that. It has a very powerful mod module system that we're not going to get into. It is relatively fast. We claim that it has 50% of speed to C. We're hoping that once some of the new work that's happening in the compiler lands, we'll actually get like 90% of the speed to C. And maybe there'll be another talk about that sometime in the future. But it has historically been single threaded, which meant if you wanted to write programs right across many cores, you had to spin up multiple programs do coordination outside of your program, do serialization in some way, right? And a lot of companies have built massive systems in this, in this fashion. But if you don't want to do that, and you still want to have some semblance of concurrency, then we use monads for that, which I'm not very happy with. Lastly, the philosophy of this line of thinking, and all camel uh, in, ge in general, is that we will make illegal states unrepresentable. <coughs> This might be irrepresentable. English is not my first language, so bear with me here. And we also handle all, these, all of these errors via monads, like a result monad. I'm not doing that. Good. Not, not even enough. All right, perfect. OCaml okay, primer. Module, this is exactly the same code translated over. Uh, speakers, we've got some speakers here. We've got the function for defining the talks, right? And we'll see some differences, right? Modules are actually values and they're global, so you can have only one name of a module, right? On the entire program, unless you start nesting them and then you have namespaces, right? They are top level values, like lists. Functions are themselves, oh, these arrows are a little wonky, sorry about that, are values as well. And we do pattern matching as an expression very explicitly. This is something you can do in Erlang as well, but maybe not as common. So here we're grabbing the value, matching on that, and we have literals that we pattern match against. We have exhaustive pattern matching, which we did not have in Erlang. So in Erlang, in our function, right, we just had two different inputs defined. If you call that function with anything else, you will blow up saying, I don't know what to do, right? Here the compiler tells us, hey, string, clearly the input of this function, right, is a very large type. These are not all the strings, so what should I do for all the other strings, right? And we use results to handle errors. So if we do find, for example, Sabine's talk here, then we get the name of the talk, right? And if we don't find it, then we just get a, an error here. This has no talk phone found for uh, this name. Going back to OCaml being historical, historically single-threaded, this is how you probably would write a little function, right? That fetches a user from a database, maybe gets a name, and that might be something that has some side effects, right? We have this monadic style of programming, right? Where we have the symbol, which you might, some of you might recognize as bind, right? And then we have this other symbol, which is monadic map. And these are sort of sequencing these operations, right? And some people love this. But I think it can get really hard to read, especially when you introduce new people to a code base, right? And of course, once we get the result, right, of these operations, then we'll actually match on that and try to do something like print the username or handle the error somehow. So, did I miss something? No, that's all. Very recently, you were able to, <laughs> to start writing programs that never failed now in multicore with OCaml 5, right? And OCaml 5 comes with two massive things. One of them is the ability to do shared state parallelism. So remember, before, right, two years ago, up to two years ago, all OCaml programs run on a single thread operating system thread, right? There is a thing called thread in the standard library, but don't be fooled by it. It is not what you think it is. It's just poorly named. And it runs on a single thread. But OCaml 5 and above, they introduced the, the idea of a domain, which by the way, that's actually a thread. That maybe should have been called thread. A domain is an operating system thread and some of the magic to make sure the garbage collection runs correctly across all of the threads that you're using. 
The second big thing that it introduces is algebraic effects. And as far as I know, it is the only language that is moderately used in the industry that has something resembling algebraic effects. And some Haskellers might disagree with me. That's okay. And this allows for direct style I.O. So you don't have to use monads for concurrency anymore, right? You can actually say, I'm going to call a function. That function will use some effect. And that's sort of like a black magic that we don't really talk about. And it will suspend. And eventually, it will continue. So the code that we get to write looks a lot more like sequential code. But each one of these steps is actually suspending, suspending via uh, an effect. We still get to do the error handling in the same monadic style with a result. But that's fine. Not all monads are evil. OK, so what the hell is an algebraic effect? This is a little primer. They are like exceptions you can resume. That's uh, the easiest way to put it, to try to appeal to the knowledge that most of us here will have. If we've had to deal with exceptions in many languages. Imagine that once you try some function, right, and you throw an exception and you catch it, you get to do some work, and then you can resume exactly where the exception was thrown. That is the basic idea, right? In practice, it's, uh, it gives you some primitives to deal with these things called uh, continuations that are resumable. So you can sort of suspend a stack of execution, right? And say, I'm going to resume that sometime in the future, right? And maybe it started to click in some of your heads, how is it that we will get something like Erlang on a camel by now? All applications, though, have to be wrapped. So in the same way that when you have a function that throws an exception, right? You need a try catch around it to be able to catch that exception. If you have an effect and you need to act on that effect, you need a handler. And OCaml gives you two ways of dealing with that. You have deep handlers and shallow handlers, right? Deep handlers are like a try catch that never stops catching things. Like you can keep running and keep returning to the code, and it always just goes back to the same try catch. And shallow ones just do it once. So you throw an effect, or you raise an effect, or as we say, we perform an effect, and then the handler picks that up, does some work, and it ends. And you can tell it to continue, do another step, another iteration. And this is useful to see how long, or rather control, how you step over functions, right, that do have effects. OK. The last thing is programs that bring you joy. And this might be the one that is the least technical, but I think it's pretty much the most important part of how Riot is being built, not exactly what Riot is. There's been a lot more research in the last decade right, <coughs> about what makes developers happy, what makes developers productive. There's been a lot of research on cognitive load, for example. The dev, uh, Get the X company has been sponsoring a lot of research in that space. And they've done work, for example, in defining Dora metrics for engineering productivity in organizations and defining space metrics. These have kind of cool names, but they, yeah, that's uh, the end of it, right? And most recently, last May, they released a paper called DevX, D-E-V-E-X, that uh, you realize now I should have linked into this slide, that defines 26 different factors that affect how people are productive and happy in an organization when they're building software. And that includes things like, for example, right? Uh, do we have short feedback loops? Are we, uh, are we actually waiting too much on, on the work that we do, right? Do we have a compiler that's low, that's affecting how people literally think about the work that they do and engage with it, right? Do we have a cognitive load that's reduced in terms of processes, in terms of the amount of things that people have to learn, right? If you're building a new team, right, what do these people already know that you can reuse instead of saying, screw it, we're going to start learning from scratch how to build everything in this new platform, right? That kind of cognitive load can get in the way. Not always. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't learn anything new ever, right? But be conscious that that affects you. And also, are you building a, a culture, which is a really hard thing to do? It's, I'll tell you, it was much easier writing Riot than building a safe, positive culture around Riot, right? And that affects a lot the kind of people that engage with you, with your community, how they engage, right? The kind of contributions you can get. And I want to talk just for a little bit here about two, two communities that are doing a fantastic job here, right? So Elixir and Go have done a great job at defining what? Oh, OK. So the GIF is now playing. 
but I guess that's on me. Sorry about that. A defining projects, right, that build around the idea of productivity for the developer, right, around the idea of ease of collaboration with examples, right, with good documentation that's straight to the point, right, that doesn't just need to have many words, it's just like, this is what you need right now, right? Uh, Bubble T is one of those two we frameworks. They have over a hundred contributors right now and it's a relatively new project. Go is doing a great job in that space. <laughs> also being a language that's designed to be relatively easy to read, even though I know it's, you know, kind of sucks. It's not the language I would like to write myself, right? But they do a good job in that space. And that's something we can definitely learn because most of the people that I know that are Go programmers are very happy in that ecosystem. And I love OCaml, but I'm very unhappy writing OCaml. It's like, why do I do that? You know what I mean? It's like, what's happening here? The other example that I have is Elixir with Phoenix. And this is a much larger project with like over a thousand contributors, right? And this project has been up for about a decade, a little more, right? And it's a web framework. And people just love it. If you go around Twitter just searching for Phoenix, you'll see so much love for the tool, for the, for the code. Right? When you go into Phoenix, you start seeing like, oh my god, they have written some things in very questionable manners. You know? well, maybe that's my assessment as a non like, Elixir what is it, practitioner. Right? I don't write Elixir anymore. Uh, but the entire community, the way that they build sort of Elixir, not just the, the code, but the project, right, is something that I think is worth looking into. So these are, these are code bases that literally bring joy to the people writing them, using them. And I think that's something really important to do. Whatever it is that you're doing, if you're not having fun doing it, you're going to do a shittier job than if you were having fun doing it. All right. So, and what do we have to choose? I don't think so. I think we can have all of them. And my GIF's not going to play. <laughs> right? <laughs> but if you know this movie, you know that this is the scene where they ask each other both? Both? Yeah, we can have both. Okay, let's have both. So, I want to talk a little bit about Riot. <laughs> this is a picture I took uh, this uh, weekend, actually. Uh, all of the pictures in the, the, in the presentation are mine. I do a little bit of amateur screen photography. Um, watching the League of Legends uh, championship happening here in Berlin, not far from, from where we are right now. Riot is an actor model scheduler for Camel 5, so the one that comes with multi-core. Right? And it aims to be many things. It's kind of ambitious, I'll admit, right? But we're starting very slowly, very pragmatically, chopping it down to the sort of things that we need right now. We're not going to build things horizontally. We're not going to build this massive platform nobody would use, right? We're building vertically. Which I think is the right way of building software. It aims to be as type safe as every OCaml program that you see out there, right? And hopefully it will be type safe enough. It aims to be as scalable as the Erlang virtual machine, which is a very, very high order of business. I don't think that we'll get there, but if we get 80% of the way, I'd be more than happy. It aims to have an ecosystem that is very welcoming. And I think that we've done a good job in that space by streaming some of the things we do and showing that the developers of this thing, not just me, we'll see in a second, are humans and we fuck up and we do that live. And we learn from the people we're like, talking to. We learn from the people that are using Riot, right? And it's also optimized for IO heavy and sub real time workloads. So if you're building web apps, if you're thinking, damn, I love Go, but I would love to maybe have more type safety, then Riot will definitely be the thing that you want to use. So this is what Riot look, look, looks like. It's a common code, just like any other common kind of program, but it's using algebraic effects to give you the same things that you would get in our lab. So we have a little uh, opening of a module on top, just so we have access to some types. We have an extensible type for messages, and we'll talk about that in a second, but all messages are typed in Riot. We have functions like spawn to create a new, uh, a new process out of a function, right? And this will be an entirely isolated unit of computation, right? That will be scheduled on its own, and it will be completely non-blocking from the current thread of execution. We have the ability to send messages, right, by the identifier of a process, a process identifier we call PID, right, and you can receive messages. And receive expressions may actually suspend the process. If you don't have anything in your mailbox, right, it will just wait there. And these are sort of the core 
building blocks. This was like the prototype of Riot. Once we had that, it was like, yeah, we can do this. We can build systems like we do in Erlang. We have processes and we have message passing. That's it. We can start building everything else. So I want to walk you a little bit about how it works because I think that's one of the most important, uh, like one of the things you are here to see. You'll see that this is very similar to the Beam architecture, the Erlang virtual machine architecture. We have a program, your application. You have many processes, right, that we uh, created with Spawn. You have the Riot runtime with many schedulers, each one of yours corresponding to a thread in the operating system. You have an IO thread that handles, handlers um, syscalls, for example, uh, doing poll on ePoll or just waiting for KQ events on Mac OS and BSDs, right? And the process queues inside of each scheduler take care of grabbing the processes and working through them. So how does that work? This is a little heavier of a slide. And mostly we'll focus on the drawing because it's a little prettier, right? Every scheduler just has a queue that it pops a process from, right? And he tries to step on it and say, hey, do I still have some work to do here? Is there what we call reductions left, right? What's a reduction? A reduction is like a step in the execution of that process. And we measure that by counting the number of effects. Remember before we talked about shallow and deep effect handlers? And the shallow ones allowed us to say, we'll run one effect, and then you get to choose what to do. That's how we do it here, right? If we have reductions left, we handle an effect. And of course, you may not have an effect, so this may run for a little bit. But if you do have an effect, we only have three. We only need three effects to be able to build systems like this. And in fact, I would say you need two, but the third one is mostly to have good performance I.O. You need a way to say, I am yielding, right? So you tell the scheduler, maybe you know, consider this amount of work done. A way of receiving messages, because you want to be able to pause the execution of a process when you get a message, right? Or when you're waiting for a message. And you want to, in the third case, want to be able to say, I need to be woken up whenever this file is available, this socket has something to read from, and so on. So this is just a look that happens. The IO thread is essentially doing uh, you know, polling on the operating system and updating some uh, timers. Some of the design decisions behind Riot are that processes are just data. It's just a, like 140 word data structure. It's about two thirds of what Erlang processes weigh. Which I'm really happy about, but of course we don't do half the things Erlang does yet, right? <laughs> and spawning them is really, really fast because we're just allocating that, and they eventually will get initialized, eventually will get picked up by a scheduler. Messages are shared data. So sending a message is literally saying, I'm going to grab the pointer to this data structure, because you know, come all data is in the heap, and I'm going to put that pointer right into the mailbox of a process. So it's really, really cheap to do that. It's so cheap that it doesn't even make sense to like measure it in some sense, right? It's like this is the smallest operation you can have in OCaml to move data around. We have cooperative scheduling. I wish we had preemptive, like Erlang does, to be able to stop a process at any point. But we're going about this in two ways. The first one is that we do have the yield effect, right, in the standard library for Riot in strategic places. So if you're using our collections, then they will have yields here and there, so that you don't have to worry too much about that. All of the I.O. library we build introduces the yields wherever it makes sense. And we have some guidelines. So if you're going to be writing a hot loop, like a while true, do something, right? Then it's by documentation sort of recommended to please put that yield there. Otherwise, you're going to very quickly start the scheduler. It's just going to shut down, right? There's a single message type for the entire system. And some people might think, like, well, but that doesn't make any sense. But thanks, thankfully, the scoping rules we have in OCaml allow us to keep different message constructors completely isolated from each other. And it also means we can add more system level messages that we need to have, like signals between processes when you want to say, tell this process that this won't die, right? You don't have to define this for yourself. There's a lot of room for improvement here, and we're working on message selectors. So you can narrow down from that massive type specifically to the two, three things that you care about. We're going for a batteries included ecosystem because we don't want to go into a runtime where you have to bring a new standard library and everything. We want you to be able to build systems on top of this immediately, right? So we have <coughs> things like this TCP listeners and streams so that you can just write socket based applications if you want. And all of that is currently being used in some of the examples that hopefully I'll get to show. And we're trying to learn from the best. So a lot of the things we built in this ecosystem are coming straight out of Elixir Erlang 
and go. Because these are some of the best platforms for these kind of systems right now. They may not be typed, but they're doing a lot of things well. So the demo I wanted to show you, hopefully, <laughs> will run now. <coughs> and all right, the demo gods are not being kind to me today. It's essentially uh, a small, let's see if I do play, yeah. So a small web stack that we've been building called Suri, like the Rea Penata that you find in the Andes in Latin America. And it gives you live views. If you're familiar with that, if, sorry, if you're not familiar with that, it's a way of updating state in the browser via WebSocket by sending diffs of the application straight from the server. And to do that, we actually build this entire stack, including connection pools, a web server, right, like support for HTTP and WebSockets and so on. Uh, all of that, by the way, also built on stream live. And the Riot stack down here is sort of comprised of more parts that we didn't get a chance to demo, but that are also interesting, like a new kind of string for a camel that allows you to do uh, pattern matching like you would do in Elixir or Erlang. And I also had some of the code to go through that example and say this is how it works. Um, so this will be like you know, your main module. You start your application with a couple of sub-modules, right? Each one of those, like the Bazaar application, is a supervision tree that says, I want to start my endpoint, right? And some channel manager for sending messages, right? The channel manager, the endpoint itself is using the trail library, right? To start a web server on port 8080 and define some middlewares in a router. And then in the router, we have like regular HTTP get uh, sort of methods, but also we have sockets or live updatable things. But yeah, so I'll skip a little bit here. Uh, the last thing, and I guess I have what, five minutes maybe? Seven. Seven, okay, cool. Um, the last thing I want to share is the ecosystem and the community. And uh, I'm actually very happy about that photo in particular from all of them, because I, I had it from months ago and it was like, oh, it fits perfectly here. It's really all about the people. Like, we love the tech stuff, but Without the people, we'd be lost. It would just be one guy doing this and nobody giving a shit, right? And that's not what we want. So we are really trying to build a whole ecosystem and community around Riot so that people can bank on it for building their next business. This is very, very, very practical minded. I come from startups, right? I need to know that I'm building the thing that people will use, right? If I'm not building something people will use, it doesn't matter. Like I'm not a researcher. I appreciate researchers doing that, right? For advancing the field, it's just not in me, right? So from that point of view, I'm trying to have a very clear mission, and we're trying to make Ocampo SaaS ready. And that might sound a little grandiose, but here we are. And the goal is to have a public, visible roadmap, right, that can get people on board into the ecosystem very quickly as contributors or users. We have over here a Riot, a Riot roadmap where a lot of people have been helping with. We'll get to that in a second. So this community has a clear mission. It's easy for people to rally behind it and say, yeah, I agree with that or not. I don't agree. And then I'll do something else. Completely fine, right? And it's very pragmatic. So all of the code that we've written, not only has been, re has been written with other people looking at it while it was being written, but it's being written so that it's easy to read and maintain. So we have, and I can say this, zero monads. <laughs> <laughs> Except for results, right? <laughs> but we don't even use like monadic bind on results. There's pattern matching. Pattern matching is good enough. You should use that. Uh, and we're going for a kind of type safety that people in Ocamel sometimes, and definitely people in Haskell, would not like, which is reasonable, right? So you can type everything all the way down to like the last permutation of bits, right? But sometimes that gets in the way. And I appreciate that we can strive to make like typed SQL queries that just verify everything in your database, right? But I also want to be able to put together this prototype in like two days. I don't want to do puzzles. I want to solve problems. <laughs> so we're aiming for that here. So a lot of things are like, OK, this is OK to be a string. It will just be a string. We'll deal with that later. It could be an assertion at runtime. It won't be the end of the world. We'll be fine. And lastly, which I think is one of the most important things, we're really trying to build a community that is safe, right? That people can come in here, and people are kind to each other, and we're helping each other learn. And many of the people that have been contributor, contributing they're not like OCaml devs. They are learning OCaml, right? And we need to build a space where they feel safe to say, hey, I don't actually know how to do this, right? 
instead of spending weeks and weeks and weeks trying to do something and then coming back and say like, oh, I'm frustrated, I will not ride a camel, right? Whereas it could have been a 15 minute conversation to say, oh, actually, no worries, it's this way, you can go here or there. But if we don't make space for people to do that, then they're not gonna do it, and then it's kind of our fault that they did it. And of course, we wanna have a ton of fun, and we're really trying to do that. So, this is what the ecosystem is starting to look like, and it's been maybe five months of building from scratch. We've got over 50, uh, 20 repositories currently at work. These are some of the people that have been building with me, with the people in the ecosystem, right? Over 25 amazing contributors. I will list all of the names and we'll name them so they're in the video, but it's a little too much. And we've had also 32 awesome sponsors uh, helping actually make the ecosystem great in other ways. Like, we got a little money, we managed to get a domain for Riot, right? And then we have a website for that. And that helps people coming here, right? And actually find these things and then see the work that other people are doing. So this is something that I'm very proud of because it's a non-technical achievement that really helps validate that the things that we're building, maybe you can disagree about how we're building them, right? But they're useful and people are using them. And that's all I have for you. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, thanks so much, Will. Well, a few minutes left for questions, if there are any. I get, I'm pretty sure there are. Yeah. Um, you to select. Yes. So are you also supporting supervisors in right? Yes, absolutely. So we've implemented processes first, and message passing as a basic signal. And then we've added like more complex emails, like monitoring and, and actual links between processes. And that was fun to do, because there's a lot of subtle bugs there, like something dies before the other thing dies, and then the they try to mark the other thing as dead before it actually gets there. And you know, we need some synchronization. And once we had that, it was like, okay, now we're ready. Now you can say, I'm gonna trap those signals, right? Like if, uh, if the other process, sorry, I'm just like assuming everybody understood all of that. But maybe like you have two processes that are running and you wanna make sure that when this one dies or terminates, this one gets a message saying this process is terminated. And then we can build supervisors. So we have a tiny supervision module that right now implements one strategy, one for one. Uh, it would be okay to implement, like add more. And if you're interested, I'd be happy to show you how. So you can help out in the ecosystem as well. But we also have dynamic supervisors that are coming from Elixir. Uh, and those are kind of cool because you can use them to define pools of workers, right? That get spawned uh, as you need them instead of like at once, but they are throttled. So you want up to 100 of them. And we're using that for connection pooling in the Atacama web server, and we're using that in a database project as well. And I saw also another hand over there. Yes. Yeah, but, um, maybe my question is ignored because I have no old handle background at all. Um, no worries, go I for was it. just wondering about this yield statement that you said that you should like sprinkle in yes. to have this preemptiveness in some yes. sense. I was just wondering how expensive is that? Because if you throw like lots of those in, if it's rather expensive, then maybe it costs more to like every time I go back to the process because nothing else. Correct. Context switching is expensive. Um, Riot is not uh, is not designed right for a CPU bound work. So if you need to do CPU CPU bound work, either and you want to use Riot or you are already using Riot, <coughs> you will you can do some like heuristics, right? Like if you have a hot loop, you can maybe say I'm going to keep a counter and every million iterations I will actually suspend. And some people are doing that. Uh, we are, this week actually, we're, uh, we have someone building a GUI framework, like an actual native GUI framework, and they want to have essentially a busy loop on the renderer side. So we're going to be in, uh, prototyping a spawn blocking function that lets you spawn a process on its own thread. And there you wouldn't need to sprinkle any yields because that thread is yours. You can do whatever you want. But for the most part, if you're just going to write systems in Riot like you would do in Erlang or Elixir, you don't want to have something that's like, uh, sort of CPU bound. It's, they're not designed for that. Yeah, yes, many colors. First of all, uh, thank you for mentioning the positivity aspect. I think that's very valuable. Um, we're using Alexia mostly because the distribution features work. We have that on your roadmap, so distribution across the network. That's an excellent point. Uh, on, the, on the Riot README, I've explicitly listed a couple of like non-goals, being uh, hot code reloading, one of them and the other one being distribution. Uh, so I've, I've, uh, I've written a lot of systems in Erlang at companies like Klarna, 
where distribution was the way to build the system, and it kind of, it's, it's kind of a pain in the ass. Uh, I know that it's gotten better over the years, but every time I had to build something new in Erlang, I've said, I'll rather stick like Kafka somewhere in the middle, right, than have this system coupled, right? Um, however, if we have valid use cases and there's demand for building it, right, and we can make it safe, I'm all in for that. Yes? Um, do you have um, pretty also advanced routing, for example, of your eyes, which have complex stuff in there, so uh, like in an HTTP framework? Mm -hmm. And connected to that, um, do you have uh, or plan to have uh, open API uh, integration for generation? <coughs> open API, okay, <laughs> good question. Uh, and I haven't, haven't thought of that. To be completely honest, the phase one of the ecosystem, that is what we're building here, right? It's a very, very small vertical slice of all of these libraries so that we can uh, prototype some things like, for example, a tiny package manager for a camel just to see what things look like, right? Or how could they, how could they, they could look like, right? Um, so Trail, which is the middleware framework, like plug in Elixir, right? Uh, does have a router that does capture of uh, parameters in routes, right? But it's not too expressive right now. It's definitely something that could be improved. Hopefully that answers the question. Perfect. Uh, yes, blue over there. On one slide, uh, you mentioned that you want to embrace other languages. Um, was it meant that you want to uh, implement uh, a compiler from Elixir to, to your VM, or, or was it more like people at least come, come to us? Uh, so, I think there's something we don't do in software engineering that we need to do a lot more, and that is reading other people's code. We don't look at other projects in other communities nearly enough, right? There's people in Elixir that have figured out how to actually write amazing web stacks, and they replaced their, their inherited web stack from Erlang over the years, right? And some of the things they've built there are just fantastic. They're so nice, and they're so performant that Looking at the code, you understand the problem so well that porting that over becomes trivial. And we've done that a lot on stream. So for example, Atacama is a port of a Thousand Island from Elixir, right? Since they have a very similar computation model, we've been able to go and say, hey, this is how you structure the solution to that problem, right? So instead of having to reinvent the wheel from zero, I don't care, I don't, I don't need to be like, uh, like say a novel author of a new way of writing web servers. I just want a reliable web server that I can build a company on, right? And these people have it in, in, in Thousand Island and Elixir. So that's sort of what we're doing. We've done the same thing with almost every layer of the stack, looking at how people are doing things. Our implementation of byte strings is inspired by closure transients, right? And by C++ uh, ropes, rope strings, which are part of the protobuf implementation from Google. Um, so that's that's sort of what I mean. Like, let's look around at what people have done already instead of trying to figure out things on our own, and then just move on to the interesting problems. Of course, maybe if you're a researcher, then you want to be down there coming up with the new things, but I'm not, so I don't need to do that. Does that answer your question? Yes. Perfect. I think one more, maybe. We got one more question. Uh, yes. How did that start, project? Right, so oh, that's a, it's a long story, uh, <laughs> but I'll try to compress it. So, last question. Well, <laughs> last question. Especially in terms of like uh, growing community. Okay, so uh, six years ago, I <coughs> tried to bring the actual model to Okamo, and it didn't work because we didn't have Okamo five, Okamo core, that failed. Then I thought maybe I can do the opposite. I can bring Okamo to the Erlang VM, and so I wrote Caramel. Uh, which was a programming language or a backend to the Ocamo compiler. That also didn't work. But there we started building the idea that maybe we need uh, stronger types on the beam, on the other end. Louis Pilfall with Gleam, which just released V1, so definitely go check it out, has been doing the same work, right? Diligently for years as well, and it's really paying off, and I'm super happy with that. But at some point I realized this is too much work for me to do, like building an entire language, so I'll just put it on a shelf. And eventually Ocamo 5 came up, and we started uh, I started thinking maybe this is time the time to rebuild the thing that we had from before Carmel, right? So that's how Riot came to be. It was sort of a birthday present for myself. Can I do this? Let's figure it out. Now, by building that in public, and this is super important, by building everything in public from zero, from like I don't really know what I'm doing to like, oh, we have something that works to shit, this is really fast, right? And we could build something big there. We have been slowly getting the interest of different people. 
people from different communities, right? One of the people here, uh, Ryan Winchester, who's been helping out with Atacama and the design, he's for, from Elixir. He writes primarily Elixir, right? But he saw this on Twitch and was like, oh, you're building some interesting things here, like types for Elixir, I'll be into that, right? So he started helping. And just by being public, right, you can find people that are interested in collaborating with you. And that's how the community started sort of uh, growing. However, I will add two more things. One of them has been that some popular streamers started doing work on a panel. So one of them, uh, Tij Devry, I cannot find here, this guy over here. Uh, you might find that icon somewhere on the internet, right? He's a rather large streamer on Twitch, and he does a lot of things for the Neodym community, and was writing Camel, and he's using a lot of the things of the ecosystem. I'm really happy about that. Uh, he brought a lot of attention to Camel. And the second thing has been the work that Sabine, right here, has been doing on the ocaml.org team at Taridas. So she's leading that team, right, and is doing a lot of work to make sure that the language is more accessible. Because it's not enough, right? Just here, forget that we're programmers for a second. Think of this as marketers, right? We get thousands of people on the front page, right? If we're not capturing that, then we're failing, right? If we want to build a community, we need to make sure that every single person that gets to that landing page actually converts to a user, to someone that cares about the language and can use the language to solve the problems, right? So, does that answer the question, Morris? Perfect. 